Hello and welcome to this sixth lecture in this series. So, so far in this course we've think, thought about atomic structure um, and the electronic structure of atoms. We've then combined our atoms together and used linear combination of atomic orbital theory in order to generate our molecular orbitals. And then we've put electrons into these orbitals to generate molecules and we've calculated their electronic states and we've thought about transitions between these electronic states. So now it means we're actually in a place to be able to think about doing some spectroscopy and thinking about different molecules, different, different cases which might arise. There's a few basics we need to cover first before we get on to actually looking at, at spectra. So um, the first of these is I'll, I'll mention a whole range of different types of well, there are a whole range of different types of electronic spectroscopy um, in, in which different transitions take place. So the example you've already seen um, in the second year physical chemistry labs, I think, um, was the ultraviolet visible absorption spectroscopy of the iodine molecule. Um, in this experiment, you excite an electron from um, a ground electronic state in, in iodine um, up to an excited um, orbital. There are lots of other types of um, electronic spectroscopy techniques as well though. So there's a lot of photoelectron spectroscopy techniques, so ultraviolet photoelectron spectroscopy, x-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, when we excite um, an electron from a molecule to, to the vacuum, so it actually leaves the molecule. There's lots of other acronyms that you will see if you look in a book on electronic spectroscopy as well things like Zeke spectroscopy, um, X-ray absorption spectroscopy, <coughs> Nexafs, Zanes, Auger spectroscopy, um, all sorts of other electronic um, spectroscopy techniques, some of which you'll either um, learn about with other uh, members of staff or you may have seen in previous years. The first thing we need to think about when considering electronic spectroscopy is the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. We know that electrons are much lighter than the nuclei, and if you look it up in your data book, you'll see that a, one proton is about 1,800 times heavier than an electron. This means that the nuclei effectively don't move on the electronic time scale. And in turn, this means we can now separate the nuclear and electronic motion. In mathematical terms, this corresponds to separating the, the total wave function into nuclear and electronic components. So I'm going to write a nuclear component and an electronic component. Once we've separated the wave functions, this you might remember from the second year spectroscopy course, so the energy is now becomes a sum of these two, two, two terms. So we get a nuclear energy term and an electronic energy term. And there are other terms as well, but for the purposes of this course we only need to think about the nuclear and electronic terms. The next thing we need to think about is the so-called Frank Condon principle. And basically this says that electronic transitions are very fast, because an electron is moving from one place to another, and we know electrons are light so they move fast. So effectively, during an electronic transition, the positions of the nuclei aren't going to change. So that means transitions, if we draw them on, a, on an energy level diagram, are vertical. So you'll have seen lots of cases when we draw an initial state, I, a final state, F, and then we draw the trans represent the transition between these two states as a vertical line. If we now move to thinking about potential energy surfaces for atoms or molecules, um, we, can, we then have to remember that we draw vertical lines on these diagrams too. So if we're going to have a vertical transition, we need to be careful in, that we ha in order that we define a well-defined starting point and end point. So if we now, if I draw a potential energy curve for a molecule in the ground state, so let's call this state X. Then if I draw another potential energy curve for an excited state of this same 
uh, molecule. So let's let put E up the axis here. And let's call this A. So we'll be labeling the states as discussed last time. If we have a transition going from X to A, we need to start somewhere on X and we need to finish somewhere on A. And you'll remember from the second year spectroscopy course that within an electronic state, we've got a number of vibrational states. So they get to start off widely spaced and then they get closer and closer together. And of course our excited state is the same, so we have a ground state and we have states that then get closer and closer together as they go, go up in energy. So if we're going to have a transition between a molecule in the ground electronic state and the excited electronic state, we also are going to start in a particular vibrational state. So we might go from a molecule here in the ground vibrational state, in the ground electronic state, then we have to draw a vertical line and we'll end up somewhere perhaps this vibrational electronic state. So here you can see I've drawn the diagram, I haven't drawn, put the axis label on the on the the, the um, x-axis, so the bond just the bond length, and I've drawn a vertical line to represent a transition. Now so we've got a well-defined starting point and end point. There are a few more other little things that we need to think about. Now, the first of these is we need to think about the shape of the wave function in functions in these um, different orbitals. Sorry, not these orbitals, in these different um, vibrational levels. So if I now draw an energy a Morse potential again, okay, and if I draw in the state which has V primed, V double primed, sorry, equals zero. So this is the ground vibrational state in the ground electronic state. Can you remember what the wave function looks like for this state? Well, it looks something like this. So we've got a... So it looks something like that. So this was one of the things we saw in the second year course, and some of the interesting things about that are in here we have a maximum in the middle of the vibrational state. So you've got to, you can see here in the middle middle of the state here we've got the highest value of the wave function. So when we square the wave function to get the probability, we have the highest probability of this molecule being at this bond length corresponding here in the middle. And this was a, an odd thing because if it was a classical vibrating molecule, the maximum probability is at the ends, so the two ends. So it'd be classically you'd expect it to be here and here most of the time, but quantum mechanically it, it, you find out it's in the middle. Now if I just take an excited state, so I don't know, V double primed equals let's say 27, what does the wave function look like for this state? Well, as you go higher up in energy the wave functions start to look more and more like you'd expect for a classical situation. So the wave function here would look something like this. So you've got a We've got a maximum here, we've got various wiggles in the middle, and then we've got another peak, another maximum in the probability at the other end. So you can see in this case here, you, the like, most probable place of finding the molecule is at the ends, which is closer to, which is what classical mechanics would suggest. Okay, so when you undergo a transition from from one state to the next, so you can imagine now we've got another another state with wave functions that are excited state A, which has wave functions in, which look similar, like that. When we go from a ground state to an excited state, we'll, as well as knowing how strong the transition is, in terms of the transition dipole moments, so again that was a concept which we saw in the second year, 
The other thing we need to think about is the the overlap between these vibrational wave functions. So we've got this is v double prime, sorry v prime equals one is zero, and this is v prime equals I don't know twenty seven. Let's go back. So when we undergo a transition, we've got to think about the overlap between the initial vibrational wave function and the final vibrational wave function. So we have this additional term we need to think about. So so the vibrational wave function in the excited state, we take the complex conjugate, and we multiply this by the the vibrational wave function in the ground electronic state, and we integrate all that over overall space, so d tau. And this gives us this gives us a number. Ah, um, let's go back there. Number. Sorry about this. This gives us a number, and this number gives us an indication about the, the strength of the transition. So this gives us leads eventually leads into the intensity of the, the, the transition. Okay, let's think of take some examples now. Oh yeah, before before we do that, I should just mention um, if you can now get a whole series of transitions. So. If you did the iodine experiment in second year, you've got a whole series of peaks in your spectrum, and these peaks can be broken down into progressions or sequences. You can see progressions here. We've got three different progressions. We've got a, a progression where all of the molecules start in the ground vibrational state. These all start in the um, first vi excited vibrational state, and then we've got another progression where they all start in one of the excited in the excited electronic state and then um, they emit light so these are all progressions because they share in common a single um, um, starting in either initial state well initial state in, the, in this case sequences here we can see do not share the same starting point but they're the, the similar transition between the two electronic states okay Let's think now of some specific examples. Let's have a case where Re double primed here. So this is the bond length of the molecule in the ground electronic state is about the same as the equilibrium bond length in the excited electronic state. So this is where we have to draw fairly carefully. So this is an energy level diagram, so energy across here, and we have bond length down here, and here we have our R E. Now if you have a so this is our ground state, our ground state X. And now I'm gonna draw an excited state which has more or less the same equilibrium bond length, so it's A as our ground state. Let's say we're at room temperature um, and most of the molecules are in the ground of vibrational state so that this is this wave function. The wave function looks like this. So we have V double prime equals zero. Now this means most of the molecules will be the highest probability will be here in the ground vibrational state. If we undergo a transition, it will be vertical. So we can draw a vertical line up here and we can see where it stops. You can imagine one place where it would stop would be the, ex the first vib the, the ground vibrational state in this electronic excited state. So V double V prime equals zero. And we can see that just by eye that the overlap between it's going from area of high probability to an area of high probability. So this means that this transition we would expect to have high intensity in the spectrum. If we now take an excited an excited vibrational state, so let's take 27, for example, the wave function here, as I drew it, looks like this, and it's got wiggles, and then the peak over here. Again, we've got to draw it vertically. 
you can see now that the overlap between this wave function in the ground state and this wave function in the excited state is going to be small. So we can straight away actually sketch what our spectrum would look like. So we put intensity up the y-axis and let's put wave number, so new tilde across the x-axis. So we go across and then we're going to get the, the first transition we're going to see, the lowest energy transition is between V double prime equals zero and V prime equals zero and we've said that's going to be strong. So it's going to be a very strong transition. We've said that V equals 27 is going to be very small, in fact, so we're probably not going to observe it. So what we're going to get in our spectrum is a series of peaks which decay very rapidly as the, the orbital overlap, so the wave function overlap, sorry, um, becomes smaller and smaller. So if you do an experiment and you observe a a progression, so it'd be a progression because all the, all of these start with with v double prime equals zero, and go up to a different value of v prime equals whatever. So we're going to have an initial strong peak, and then it's going to rapidly decay. We can now consider a couple of other examples um, along in the same in the same way. So if we now have the equilibrium bond length of the excited electronic state is larger than the equilibrium bond length in the ground electronic state. So let's draw a diagram again. So let's draw the axes on. So energy bond length. So here's the ground state x and here's the equilibrium bond length in the ground state. So if I now displace this one this is A. So you can see here we have this is our E primed. If we're at low temperature again, um, so depending on the molecule how low this temperature has to be, so for iodine at room temperature um, probably about 60% of the molecules are in V equals zero, so that's a good, good starting point. So we've got our wave function here, so V double prime equals zero. Now so again, when you draw transitions, we have to draw them vertically. Let's think about the V, v double prime equals zero to V prime equals zero transition. It's going to be vertical. How much overlap is there between the wave function here and the wave function here? Well, not very much. Where is the greatest overlap going to be? Well, it's going to be a case where if we draw this another transition nice and vertical, where this hits the edge. So this this, this level here, where we've got a peak, wiggles, and a peak. So, but this, this overlap here between the V double prime equals zero and the V prime equals 23, say, that's going to be a lot more intense. So our spectrum is going to look quantitatively different to last time. So we've got the intensity and we've got the wave number. What will happen is transitions to say V double prime equals zero to V prime equals zero are going to be fairly weak. But as we go up, as we increase V, this is the intensity is going to increase. And then it's going to decrease again. So we've got, we'll have a, a maximum here in, this, in the spectrum. I probably actually didn't draw that as well as I should have done. Let's get rid of those. Because we know that the the, ro the vibrational levels get closer and closer as you go up in energy. So what will happen is after this maximum, whoop, the, the, the peaks will get closer and closer together. So that's a better, better sketch there. Okay, so that's another example of of how a spectrum might look. So it works both ways. If we know what the bond lengths are, we can predict what the, the, the spectrum is going to look like, the, the, the absorption spectrum. Um, and if we measure an absorption spectrum, it, it has these characteristics, we can then infer straight away something about the bond lengths. So this is a very useful part of electronic spectroscopy.
let's take a final case. So again, let's draw a diagram. Energy bond length. So the ground electronic state x. So then v double prime equals zero. This is R V double prime. What we want now is um, if it's going to be significantly bigger. Let's do it here. Try again. Try and draw it reasonably accurately. Good. That looks okay. So again, if we start down here in the middle, highest probability, and then go up, what's going to be the probability of a transition to V prime equals zero? Well, effectively zero, there's no overlap. Again, the highest probability is going to be where we draw a vertical line and we intersect with the this, the, this edge of the, the well, because this is where we get the function which looks like this okay but you can see that we could also go vertically up to about here the key thing about this point here is that it's above the dissociation energy of this molecule so this wave function um, will look like that have a peak and then there'll just be wiggles dissociation this is going to have an, an effect on the on the eventual spectra that we observe. So again, what I want to do is sketch a spectrum. So intensity. Sorry, not not R. We want new. Okay. So we're going to start off with very weak intensity, and so the intensity will build till we get to a maximum, and then the peaks will get closer together. And at a certain point, we won't actually observe peaks anymore. What we'll observe is just a continuum. So this is just absorption. So we don't get any peaks anymore, we don't get any structure in our spectrum, but we just get a, an absorption continuum. So here we have, we can get a, straight away get some information about the molecule. This point here, this energy, is the dissociation energy. The dissociation limit, and then here in the spectrum we have a, a continuum. So again, this is another type of spectrum that we we might observe, and it allows us straight away to infer something about the the bonding in the molecule. Of course, if we know a system has gone from um, the bond, equilibrium bond length has significantly increased upon electronic excitation. We know that in the molecule we've significantly reduced the bonding character. So this could be a transition from, say, a bonding orbital to an antibonding orbital, or um, say a bonding orbital to a non-bonding orbital. These would lead to an increase in the bond length in the molecule. Okay, so having said that, you should now be able to use your knowledge of the electronic structure of molecules. So we've seen lots of examples, O2, NO, HCl, for example. You should now be able to suggest some molecules and some transitions for which you would expect these various cases we've seen. So these ones we've just looked at here. So the equilibri equilibrium bond length in an excited electronic state is a, more or less equal to the equilibrium bond length in a ground electronic state. Or it could be larger or could be significantly larger. I haven't mentioned this one here, but you can probably come up with some suggestions. And you should also be able to think about what the, 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 the absorption spectrum would look like if this were actually the case. Okay, one last thing I want to mention um, for today. Again, it's something which we've seen before. We saw it at the, we touched on it at the end of my second year spectroscopy course. And this is the Burge Sponer extrapolation. So we again this was part of the iodine experiment if you did the iodine experiment in the second year labs. So here we've got ground electronic state and an excited electronic state. So this is energy, this is bond length. And we do the experiment, we get lots of 
transitions. So I'm just drawing a whole range of transitions on this picture, and you get lots of peaks in the spectrum. If we can ob observe a whole um, progression, so we know we're going from to different to a whole series of levels. So we can imagine this is v prime equals eight, nine, ten, eleven. These energy levels should be getting closer together, so it's not the best drawn picture here. Um, if we look now at the, en the gap between these energy levels, this, these should be getting smaller. So if we draw a plot of the, the gap between the energy levels, so I'm going to call it delta G, so G we, we saw in the course last year was the um, the vibrational term. So delta G is the the gap between a, adjacent vibrational terms. And it's going to be in wave numbers. And if you plot across here, V plus 1, so this is the, the vibrational quantum number. It's going to be V prime plus 1. These peaks are going to get closer together, so the gap between them is going to get closer and closer together is going to get smaller and smaller. So we're going to get a plot which looks like that. So from our spectrum we can get these get these points and then we can do a nice thing which is if we draw a straight line through them and extrapolate it then we can actually work out the area under this curve with the straight line rather and this area is actually the dissociation um, energy so it's the it's the energy to go from down here in the ground electronic state up to dissociation in the excited electronic state and that's this area under this plot. In fact this extrapolation is um, a bit of an overestimate because in reality it, do it do doesn't go straight it sort of curves round a bit down here um, but it gives us a useful estimation of the dissociation of the molecule. So this is again something else we can some useful information we can get out from electronic spectroscopy. Okay, that brings me now to the end of lecture six. Um, there's no blackboard test associated with this lecture, but there was that homework task to think about um, and come along to the lecture, the timetable class, ready to put some of this into practice. <laughs>